Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Auto Central, South Africa's number one motoring podcast and uh, Auto Trader's number one channel for you to see our, uh, are they ugly faces, Wandy? <laughs> I think mine's uh, not so uh, ugly um, oh. in my personal opinion, but uh, you know, you be the judge. Well, if you want to watch us, uh, you can watch us. If you want to listen to us, you can listen to us too. And uh, as usual, my name is George Mini, and I'm joined by Wandile Sishi. As usual, uh, where can uh, people find what we're doing here? So, as you mentioned, you can definitely find us on order on the Order Trader uh, YouTube channel, um, which, which is, is Order Trader SA, correct? But if you want to listen to us, we're also streaming live um, every single Monday at 9 a.m. on CliffCentral.com. Um, but if you want some convenience, you can also just find us on Spotify or iTunes to your convenience. Um, but that'll also just be the audio. Google uh, Google Order Central or uh, or just go onto Order Trader's YouTube channel. Pretty much should be everywhere. Yeah, if you just exactly. search. <laughs> so in today's uh, Order Central episode, Wendy and I are joined by uh, none other than uh, uh, Les McMaster, who is the director of Right to Repair, and uh, Les is here to unpack the latest proposed government guidelines, or should I say Competition Commission uh, guidelines, um, and uh, that state to aim to promote more competition in South Africa's automotive uh, aftermarket environment, including manufacturing, repairs, insurance, and financing. And uh, these proposed guidelines are meant to bring more transparency into the prices and practices and give consumers more choice. And uh, it's a bit progressive uh, in relation to South Africa, but not so progressive in relation to the rest of the world, as you probably hear from Les. Um, uh, and it is, it is, it is regulatory. So uh, yeah. in the rest of the world, this has become the norm. So welcome, Les. Um, glad to have you. Thank you, George. It wasn't via. Yeah. The second time you're on with us, yeah? Second time. Second time. The last time was in the in the Cliff Central Studios, if Correct. I recall. Correct. And uh, uh, Les has not aged a day. No. Thank no. you, George. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think people are going to watch the YouTube uh, uh, just to just to see Les and uh, um, and his uh, uh, his his uh, young sprightliness. Um, I've known Les for quite a few years. How many years has it been now? Uh, to 11, 10, 11, 11, 11 years. Yeah, yeah. I've known Les yeah. for uh, for eleven years, and and uh, and I honestly can say he hasn't changed a bit. He's uh, he's still he's still. Neither of you, George. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, one is the youngster amongst us. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm I'm the young one, but I've also known Les for what like a year now. Yeah, so, yeah true. You know, it's growing. Mm-hmm. We're gonna get uh, real close. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Well, anyway, thanks for joining us, Les. Appreciate it uh, uh, extremely. And uh, and and there's, I don't think there's uh, too many people, uh, if anybody, that uh, could kind of give us the the detail of where the rubber hits the road when it comes to this topic. Because you've been you've been the one of the leaders of this right to repair uh, since day one. Give us a you know short version of the, of the history. How did you how did you end up doing this? Why did you do it? And uh, um, and uh, and where did we find ourselves just before this Competition Commission guideline uh, uh, output? Well, George, in 2009, uh, and prior to that, uh, workshop owners were at uh, loggerheads with the OEs because uh, OEs had started to code more parts into their vehicles, and that coding had to be done uh, online. Uh, and, of course, uh, the more parts that were being coded, the more... Wo- pr- um, aftermarket workshops were being excluded. So we found that um, after five, six, seven years that the vehicle had been on the road and had maybe had the third or the fourth owner, mm. uh, a part would go be faulty that could only be bought from the dealer, which is fine, uh, but that part can be purchased by an aftermarket dealer because it was a security-related part. And of course then, uh, once the owner had bought the part and he brought it to an aftermarket workshop, he had, uh, he couldn't, the art market workshop couldn't do anything with it. I mean, they could fit the part, but then it had to go back to a dealer to be coded into the VIN of the vehicle. Um, and, that, and we saw this happening more and more, and I realized that if we didn't start what, we, what it already had started in Europe, mm. uh, in South Africa, the, the right to repair, um, we would be excluded um, and be downgraded to doing only the certain mechanical work in aftermarket workshops. Which I, th- which I suppose goes away in the future of electric vehicles as well. Yeah. So absolutely. But what we were seeing in our workshops was that the third and the fourth owner uh, firstly couldn't re- afford to buy that part. And because he couldn't buy it, he, there were very uh, uh, clever people that were bypassing these parts. Oh, and wow. if you think of braking system, 
when ABS braking system was bypassed, you know, it becomes a normal braking system. But then you must rem remember that vehicle was never designed to have just a mm. normal braking system. It was designed around the ABS braking system. And we would have these cars on the road, and when they came to the workshop, you would, you know, you'd be horrified to see what, what people have done, because firstly, they couldn't afford to, to buy the part, and yeah. secondly, um, they needed wheels. Okay. Yeah, what are they going to do? And this started to escalate, and, 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 and we realized that if we didn't start the right repair in South Africa, we would be left with a lot of uh, vehicles on the road, dangerous, very dangerous vehicles on the road, yeah. um, and a lot of workshops that would be out of business. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, so, 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 let's unpack the first point, um, you know, in the Competition Commission's guidelines. But before we get there, let me just ask you this question: um, The Competition Commission kind of set out a uh, a list of guidelines. Now, guidelines is not regulation; mm. um, it's not promulgated. It's uh, it's guidelines set out by the Competitions Commission. Um, uh, maybe just explain to uh, everybody the difference between the guidelines the Competitions Commission put out and uh, and uh, and the, uh, the the concept called regulation, because I've I've heard them being used interchangeably, and I keep reminding people that this is not regulation. But um, you know, not to put words in your mouth, uh, you know, you said to me the other day, these, these are guidelines with teeth. Mm. Um, Correct. So so so, how does that work? So the competition commissioner, when we uh, initially approached the competition commissioner with the uh, with our with our concerns. You know, they had a look at it and they said, look, you know, yo, we can see this is like totally uncompetitive. Um, you, how you, you're excluding a, a large portion of the, of the, the motor industry. Uh, uh, and purely because you, you, the OEs had made these rules and were building these parts into the vehicle. And uh, they started off, uh, we, we, our first prize would have been that it became legislation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which would have been, you know, then it would have been uh, cast in stone. Yes. But the competitions commissioner said, no, no, we do it. We'll go through the thing, we'll have the consultation, and then we'll draw up the guidelines. And the guidelines will be there and will be used when we do an arbitration in the case of there being any uh, mm. complaint that, laid, that was laid with the competition commission. They would do it in the light of the guidelines will now be used to see where the uncompetitive behavior is. Okay. Is that so until it becomes control. regulation or is it just entirely? So uh, take, uh, practically, uh, if you felt that you'd been compromised, uh, yeah. you'd lay a, a complaint with the competition commissioner. The guidelines are now being discussed and have been uh, accepted by everybody. Yeah. Um, and if it said that um, I was excluded from buying a part from a, a dealer, the, the competition commissioner would look at it in the, in the, in the, in the the anti-competitive manner mm. that 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 they they rule, and they will say, yeah, we 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 in 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 favour of the complainant. Yeah, mm. yeah, And then it becomes they have to do it. Okay, yeah. okay. So, so there's the teeth. So there's the there's the mm. teeth. So so you know, uh, for all intents and purposes, it uh, you know it is it is up to the OEM whether they want to accept the guidelines and put them in place. Um, or not, and uh, uh, and then it's up to the consumer to kind of uh, chase any um, uh, anti-competitive behaviour in their uh, uh, in their opinion if they were excluded, is what you're saying. Given that they know, though, I think that's one of the big challenges is that a lot of people don't actually know what their rights are or what um, the guidelines actually state. Yeah, um, they just see it as regulation or guideline, and they kind of. Well, I think a lot, a lot of people are thinking that it's regulation when yeah. uh, when it's when it's guidelines. It's guidelines and there's, yeah. a, there's a there's a different procedure involved. There's a procedure. Yes, yeah. there's a procedure. The procedure there, procedure there has to be followed, and we've had some test cases where, um, uh, without mentioning any um, uh, models and makes yeah. uh, and, and 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 OEs, where a an aftermarket workshop uh, had a vehicle in their in their workshop, they needed to purchase a, 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 a tool to be able to do a certain uh, work on 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 that vehicle. Um, and the dealer said, sorry, we can't sell it to you. It's, you're mm. not allowed to. They put a complaint to the competitions commissioner and within a couple of days, the dealer said, sorry, we made a mistake. Yes, you can buy the tool. Oh, okay. So that's happened already. Yeah, and I mean, it could have been, a le I suppose in this, in this particular instance, it could have been a legitimate we can't sell you the tool because I don't mm. think everybody's 100% clear yet. Um, you know, a couple of, I've been asked a couple of questions where, uh, you know, I've had to ring up Les and say, I've, you know, I've been asked this question, you know, what, what yeah, is the, the what is the process? Because I don't think those, I don't think those guidelines and the route to the, to the uh, recourse is, is really that clear. 
Yes, it is actually. Uh, if you think of uh, the what what the 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 negative of it was, that the competitions commissioner didn't really state the procedure of how a claim yes. a claim should be made or a, yeah. a complaint should be laid. Um, but we as Right to Peace South Africa uh, have drawn up a, a, a document where we will um, assist the uh, aftermarket workshops and the public on how to lay the, 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 the complaint okay. and who it must go to. It's actually pretty simple, really, but, you know, it's more if somebody has a document in front of you and, you know, step by step, this is what you must do. It's a lot easier. Yes, yes. Uh, and we as Right to Peace South Africa do not lay the complaint on behalf of anybody. Okay. We will assist the, 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 the complainant. Okay, okay. All right, well, let's get into the, the, the actual de- uh, detail. And that is kind of one of the concepts in uh, in the Competitions Commission's guideline is price bundling. And when a, you know, I'll, I'll go through very quickly. When a consumer buys a vehicle, they're typically sold a maintenance plan and a service plan included in the purchase price of the vehicle. Most consumers are unaware that the purchase price of the vehicle is bundled with these value-added products. The Commission said that uh, this bundling may take the purchasing of these plans, uh, make the purchasing of these plans easier for some customers mm. who would otherwise have se- uh, sought them out separately. However, some customers can and do purchase these value-added products outside of the standard manufacturer's provided plan for third party, from third-party suppliers. So, you know, give us the, 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 the layman's version of the price unbundling, uh, Liz. So when you purchase your vehicle, um, the perception is that I'm purchasing a vehicle with a full maintenance plan. So okay. Fantastic. You know, I'm paying... This is uh, going to be my one payment and I can have my vehicle serviced. But when we were doing the, uh, the, the, the full uh, preparation of the right repair, we, we were in Europe and we were going to bring uh, a lot of expertise from how they had done it. Um, they were absolutely astonished mm. that in South Africa a vehicle is sold with a maintenance contract. It just doesn't happen. And uh, we started doing our homework and we realized that, you know, that it's, it's actually an expensive process. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because some vehicles, depending on the model and the make, uh, we're adding 70 to 80,000 Rand onto the, the price of the vehicle. Wow. And if you looked and really started to break it down, you, at most you're probably going to get two to three services. Yeah. And you take three services and divide by the, the 70 to 80,000 Rand and you realize what you're actually paying for a service. Apart from that, that's added into the HP of the vehicle high purchase, yeah. which you're paying uh, a, 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 an interest rate, rate on. So you on the 80,000 rand, 70, 80,000 rand, there's uh, high purchase charges uh, added onto that. Yes. So it's not a, it's not a, a cheap exercise. But uh, of, of course, you know, people will always want that, yes. which yeah, is good. Mm. But they also now have the option of when they purchase the vehicle that they don't have to have an included uh, service plan. Yeah. It has to be open and transparent at the point of sale. So you buy your vehicle, it would be a price, mm. and then do you want the service plan? This is the service plan, this is the price added on. Mm. Okay. So you make the decision. And if you decide that you want the service plan, you sign the contract with that OE and the yes. dealership, and then they will be doing the services. And more importantly, you can actually decide who you want to do that process with. So if you decide that you didn't want the, the, pro- the, 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 ser- the service plan, then you can take that vehicle to um, a de- a, 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 an aftermarket dealer of your choice. Yes. And yes. They, they, they do the, the services for which you will pay, but obviously we know it's going to be a It'll lot It'll be 70,000 rand. Yeah, it's going to be a lot cheaper. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that a lot of consumers are going to uh, are still uh, remain yeah. kind of in Absolutely. that uh, in that environment, and uh, because you, I mean, it 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 can't be the case that that these products from OEMs don't add value. They have to add value, otherwise, uh, you know. But I mean, I suppose it remains to be seen over time. Um, but uh, it, it you know it could create uh, an environment where the OEs can. Um, uh, um, actually get more business by being more transparent yeah. because uh, I think you and I spoke about this before it's not necessarily binary it doesn't mean just because right to repair is in place now there's going to be a mass exodus out of uh, out of these maintenance plans it's not not, it just doesn't happen you yeah. know yeah. Um, but I suppose uh, you know one of the questions in my mind is um, uh, and 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 a lot of people maybe misunderstand this um, and that is the difference between the maintenance plan and the warranty and uh, uh, so that's the unbundling of the maintenance plan and uh, the servicing of the vehicle. Let's talk a little bit about the warranty, uh, the warranty of the vehicle, because that warranty is attached to the vehicle, if I'm right. Yeah. Correct. 
And, uh, and, and every time a, a car rolls off the, the manufacturer's floor, it comes with a particular warranty. Now, what does the, uh, this, this set of guidelines do to that warranty and how is it impacted? How is that warranty impacted by these guidelines? So the uncompetitive behavior on, when it came to warranties uh, was one of the, our concerns. And the uh, competition commissioner looked at it and he said, yeah, look, you know, this, is, this is not the way it should be. We saw manufacturers that were extending warranties. Uh, mm. You'd have a warranty for three, five, ten years warranty, but the provisio was that you would have to service it uh, with them, and they could charge you what they want to. If you didn't have a maintenance plan uh, or a service plan, the, you, you still had to take the vehicle to them to have it serviced. So when the uh, competition commission had a look at the, 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 how it was being operated, you know, they, they saw the, the case of mm. it being an uncompetitive competitive uh, system and so they decided as in Europe where uh, if you have a vehicle under warranty and it's a three-year warranty you can service your vehicle with an aftermarket workshop um, and it won't affect the warranty but the warranty repair will still be done with the dealer network. Okay, so, so I there's think an answer. That's, the, that's yeah. the no. Well, that's the distinct difference: is that uh, you can't take your vehicle to an uh, uh, independent workshop and have a warranty part no. repaired. No. Yeah, you know. So, so you know, maybe that is part of uh, some of the ambiguity mm. that when I read these guidelines, it wasn't entirely clear mm. that uh, uh, you know if your gearbox breaks or if your uh, um, you know. Uh, uh, brake calipers fail. That that's actually a warranty repair, Correct. and uh, and the and the OEM still uh, has to repair it for the vehicle to maintain its warranty. So, uh, uh, you know, how do how do consumers navigate the warranty when it comes to um, having a car serviced outside of the OE network? So let's say uh, for, by an independent rep, uh, servicer, and then something major breaks. That's a warranty claim. Um, but now they've been having the car serviced outside of the uh, the OEM. So uh, previously, uh, when there was a warranty issue, the first thing that the, OEA, the, the dealer network would do, they would have, take the service book and have a look at the service book and see if the services have been kept up to date. Mm -hmm. Previously, if you had missed a service, uh, your warranty, your warranty was, expired. were expired. Yes. That was void. Yeah. So, Which I suppose, you know, in principle is, is fine. It's fair. You've got to have your car serviced in order to, 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 to keep it running. Correct. Yeah. So what would happen now if there's a, a, a mechanical breakdown or some uh, faulty part, uh, they will still see it was serviced. Yes, it was serviced by whom? Aftermarket workshop. Okay, was the procedure done correctly? Uh. Yes, the procedure was done correctly because the guidelines uh, stipulate that when a, a service is done at an aftermarket workshop, it has to be meticulously recorded. Okay. So that you know what oils were fitted, you know what parts were fitted, and you can fit aftermarket parts, by the way. Okay. Um, so all that will be recorded. But then they have a look at the breakdown. Was the breakdown, the breakdown directly attributed to uh, the service uh, in any way or form? Okay. If it wasn't, it's just normal uh, warranty. But let's say, for instance, uh, the, serv the repairer or the servicing dealer, uh, aftermarket servicing dealer, had put in a, a, a cheap filter, and that filter broke up and disintegrated and went into the oil channel and mm. caused the engine failure. Then the, aftermarket, the, the OEE would say, that was, you serviced it there, this is what happened, Here's the, we have all the, the details of what happened. Yeah. Um, now that servicing dealer is responsible for the repair. Okay. And that's why we said, when aftermarket service uh, providers uh, do service vehicles under warranty, they must adhere strictly to the service schedule. And we've, uh, we've made provision for that. We've given, they have at their disposal the absolute, every single major manufacturer service schedule. So mm. then there's no reason for them not to be doing that. Yes. So yeah. that's kind of the, I guess the guarantee for the OEM yeah. um, is that procedure that needs to be followed um, in terms of how the service is undertaken. Um, that's how they can ensure that they're not being essentially robbed or exactly. Um, or there's liability for the dealership or the, the repair, the repair uh, store, essentially. Correct. Correct. Okay. So I suppose, uh, you know, the, so what you're saying is there's some, uh, there's some uh, onus 
and recourse on mm. the service center. So this just this isn't a case of just you know anybody and their cat can open up a, 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 an aftermarket service center and begin um, you know servicing cars. There is there there are rules to follow. Correct. You know it's not like uh, you know anybody on the on the street corner can begin servicing cars. That's, exactly. That's not what uh, uh, you're you're proposing. It's it's a case of you know we want to uphold the warranty and the and the lifespan of the car by doing things properly. Okay, then uh, uh, the other concept that um, um, I suppose is is worth noting in these guidelines is the transfer of maintenance and service plans. So uh, previously, uh, was this the case or wasn't it the case? But manufacturers and other providers must transfer the maintenance plan. Now we're not talking about the warranty now because warranty is attached to the car. The maintenance plan um, and or a service plan to a replacement vehicle in the event where the original vehicle is written off by the insurer. Where there's no replacement vehicle after a right uh, after the write-off uh, and is not feasible to transfer the maintenance plan uh, or service plan uh, to a replacement vehicle, the consumer shall be afforded the right to cancel the value-added contract and receive a full refund. Um, explain to us again in layman's terms, Les, wh- wh- what does that actually mean? So from a, a new vehicle warranty, if the, v- the warranty came with the vehicle. So if uh, you, after one year, sold your vehicle that had a three-year warranty, Mm. the new owner will have the balance of that warranty. Because you the you mean the maintenance plan? Uh, no, the warranty. The warranty. the warranty. Okay, okay. So the maintenance plan is a contract between uh, the, the OE yes. and the, the owner of the vehicle. Oh, I see what you're saying. So what you're mm. saying is the, so, so even if you sell the vehicle, the warranty continues for yeah. that vehicle yeah. and yeah. the maintenance plan is slightly different. Well, they, uh, the, the competition commissioner had tried to add in uh, OEs, the, uh, the uh, many mechanical breakdown insurances and the uh, crash insurance, insurers, yes. where they would, um, you bought a car and you had a mechanical breakdown insurance uh, attached to it, for instance, a second-hand car, for instance. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so when it comes to, to, to warranties and maintenance plans um, and the transferability of those, uh, you were saying that some, uh, th- that they were, they're obviously included uh, uh, some with the vehicle, the warranty specifically, mm. but the uh, the maintenance plan is a contract between the owner of the vehicle yeah. a- and the the dealer. Okay. So in that case, where um, that is, if he had sold the, ve- the vehicle, um, he must be repaid the balance of the thing. Okay. So they sold that would be added onto his new vehicle. Okay. Mm. If he then wanted to re re re. Uh, uh, buy a new vehicle, they would give him the, the value added onto his new maintenance new plan. New maintenance plan, yeah. okay. So essentially, if you, let's say your plan is five years, ti- is five years, and then you sell your car in three years, the two years get given back to the consumer or is transferred to the new vehicle? It can either be given back, it has to be refunded, mm-hmm. uh, or in the case of a vehicle being uh, written, d- off. written off, they must be refunded, and that will cover all the, the, the insurances. Wow. So... Um, that just you, seems fair. If you had traded your vehicle in and yeah. had a balance of a, of, of a maintenance plan, yeah. they would give you the they would refund you and then sell you the new maintenance plan. Okay, okay, yeah. well, which, so which is not happening at this point in time. Well, well, I mean, just to be clear, that it doesn't mean you get a full new maintenance plan, right? You just get the balance of balance, one hundred percent, a balance of the maintenance yeah. plan. Um, and then let's move on to uh, onto parts. So the commission noted that uh, issues where it was difficult for independent repair shops to uh, obtain or approve original. Sp- parts from manufacturers. And I suppose this goes down to what you said right at the beginning. Mm. Um, and it sounded to me like uh, technology has driven that exclusion. Is As parts became more sophisticated, so it was more difficult for independent repairers to, uh, uh, to get their hands on parts and to replace uh, uh, car parts um, um, in, in the environment. Uh, you know, would, you, would you agree that it's, it's, it's because of technology? Because what, I mean, what happened 10, 15, 20 years ago? So you must remember the, uh, this uh, was talking to the um, aftermarket, uh, the, the OD, OE parts that were related to the security systems. Yes. So uh, up until about five years ago, we were allowed to buy those parts. Okay. And five years ago, they, they put a blanket um, refusal to buy any security-related parts. You okay, couldn't so buy it's, it. not, it's, not, it's not tech-related. Not it's, tech it's not because the parts have become sophisticated no, and smart. Not at all. Okay. Not they all. just closed because the door. Because the, the aftermarket workshops mm. uh, have got a lot of smart people working. Yes. Mm. And they have a lot of smart equipment. Yeah. And they are quite 
quite capable, yeah. capable of installing those parts and coding them. Okay, yeah. okay. All right, so I mean, I suppose that kind of covers the, the parts uh, um, situation. And uh, how in your experience now, it's been a very short time, you know, uh, when, when did this come about? Uh, I think it was uh, end of January? The first draft was October last year. Yes, but then finally... Oh, sorry, a, a year A year before back, that. and then yeah, before that, yeah. when, was the, when was the final draft? The final draft was December. December last the, year. The, yeah. the final code, yeah. Yeah, so the final code was December last year. So so it's, it's, been, a, it's been a shortish period since the, you know, the actual, um, call it a... Uh, uh, final guidelines have been released. Um, what have you seen out in the market? How have uh, OEMs uh, uh, responded and how have dealerships responded? Well, the OEMs uh, have re- relaxed a lot of the stringent uh, rules to the dealerships. Okay. And we've seen uh, dealerships now um, opening their own aftermarket workshops. Oh. oh which nice. previously would never, ever have okay. happened. I mean, I come from the, the dealer environment many, many years ago. Mm. Um, and, you know, you couldn't even in your own dealership, you weren't allowed to have any other make of vehicle in your workshop. Yes. Um, the right repair, the guidelines as it reads, as it reads now, yeah, will allow a, a dealer, irrespective of what make he's selling, yes. to have his own used vehicles being serviced in his workshop. Okay. Um, so those things are, are being relaxed. But it's been like that in Europe for, for 15 years, 20 yeah. years now. Yeah. So it's not new to the OEMs. I mean, OEMs have made a big Helen, uh, Helen Brimstone, uh, what's going to happen. Um, but it's, it's, it's been part and parcel of what they've been uh, doing in, in Europe and in the States. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, so I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I mean, I, I should know the answer to this, but uh, uh, you, you, you're an independent workshop uh, owner as well, right? Correct. Uh, I think it's called M Center. M Center in Centurion. Yes, yeah. yes, M Center in Centurion. I think I sent you one or two customers, did I? You did? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. I, did. I sent you one or two <laughs> customers. Uh, Les knows his stuff when it comes to uh, repairing cars. So, uh, you know, there's no. Uh, uh, there's no lack of, of knowledge there, but um, but uh, uh, I suppose the last thing that uh, that I wanted to talk about was in the future of electric vehicles. I mean, you 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 own M Center. Uh, you've been um, repairing and servicing um, internal combustion engine vehicles for a for a long long time. Um, how is the future of electric vehicles going to um, impact independent workshops and dealership workshops and OEM workshops in the future, do you think? And, and what has been done about it now? So I, I wear a number of hats. Uh, one of my hats is M Center. A lot of my, my other hat is I, I'm a board member of the RMI. Uh-huh. And also I am a shareholder in a company called Move Workshops. Okay. So Move Workshops is a concept uh, workshop uh, and uh, independent workshops uh, belong to Move. Uh, we have a what we call a Move Academy, and we've partnered with a, a service provider in Europe, a okay. European service provider, uh, and we are actively do in consultation with them on uh, uh, knowledge on um, electric vehicles. So we are they have um, training uh, facilities available yeah. where they will be training uh, aftermarket. Uh, Is this Move uh, yeah. having training facilities available? Correct. Oh, that, that, that's very that's very interesting. I mean, the 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 move movement. Um, <laughs> how did how did the name come about? <laughs> so um, four years ago, we we were sitting around a table chatting about things, and we decided to to do this concept. But it's been a, th- a thing of mine that I've had for for many years, um, from the previous uh, g- a group of companies in South Africa, yeah, mm. from Australia, and. Uh, I always wanted to start it again because I was uh, very involved in the in the previous one, and uh, we managed to get a, a number of shareholders involved, and we started four years ago, and it's, uh, we have now 100 and, sorry 215 workshops in the in the uh. concept, and we uh, we provide all this uh, to our members. Wow. I was about to say because I think it's important if we're going to move into the space of EVs, it's important that there is a network of. Um, repairers who know what they're doing, who have you know, essentially trained in how to operate them. Yeah, we want our move workshops to be the five star workshops. Oh wow! Mm. And we try and market them that way. Okay. So we um, and how we got to the name Move, uh, our one friend, our Finnish friend uh, Jana, uh, just said, "Let's move." Let's yeah, just do it. And, yeah. they're, they're, and then the name is stuck. It was one of those things just around the board. I think it's quite catchy, actually. Yeah. It's, uh, it's quite catchy. So, uh, so uh, I, I mean, I think that's all uh, we almost have time for, Les. Um, uh, any kind of final thoughts on, uh, on the industry and, uh, and your outlook for uh, 2021? 
Yeah, I don't think uh, 2021 is going to be a lot different from from what it's been. Uh, we sort of see that the right repair, uh, once uh, everybody's got used to it, will start in a six months to a year uh, from now, where we, you know people will really start using aftermarket bookshops for their first services. Brilliant stuff. Uh, Wendy, any final thoughts? Yeah, I just think as a consumer, um, it's important that you know what your rights are and understand what these guidelines mean for you because it's going to potentially save you a lot of money. Um, and yeah, it's going to make uh, this, this project and this movement a lot quicker if more people understand what's going on. So yeah, just... Trans- transparency is a good thing. It is. It's super that, important. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's been epic. There we go again. Les McMaster, Director of Right to Repair, owner of M-Center and uh, on the move. Uh, yeah. And uh, from me, George Mini and Wandile Sishi, we will see you next time. <laughs>